This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I love doing this podcast, primarily because I feel like I can ask anyone. I do have the confidence to feel like I can ask anyone. Now, they might not always say yes, but I've had a pretty good success rate. One of the coolest pieces of feedback that I've received in doing this podcast is from the author, Jack Schweiger, of Market Wizards fame. And Jack told me he really appreciated that I would go out and do the different interviews. And he noted an interview that I did with Jack Horner. Jack is a paleontologist, very well known for being the technical director of the Jurassic Park films. And most likely, if not altogether true, the inspiration for Spielberg for the main character in the Jurassic Park films. My guest today is also a paleontologist. His name is Peter Larson. American paleontologist, fossil collector, president of the Black Hills Institute of Geological Research. He excavates, prepares, sells fossils. Very interestingly, he led the team that uncovered Sioux, which is in the Field Museum in Chicago. Museum in Chicago. Great story that was made a documentary in 2014 called Dinosaur 13. Worth checking out. Now you might say, what's the personal connection, Mike? Well, I don't know how many years ago it was. 15 years ago? 12 years ago? I went to, I didn't know who Peter was, but I went to his website, the Black Hills Institute, and they're selling replica casts of dinosaurs. Scale. So you could buy a T-Rex, full beast if you want, for a particular T-Rex that his team had found. He, I think he's found more T-Rexes than anybody. It's an amazing story. So anyways, I'm surfing around. And of course, I'm like any kid who likes dinosaurs. And I'm like, well, let's just buy the scale T-Rex skull made of this like really hard resin cast, but it's the exact cast of the bones. So I bought one. Well, there goes 10 grand. Sometimes people buy cars and all that kind of stuff. I throw 10 grand at a dinosaur skull. Lo and behold, within a year or two, I bought a Triceratops, another 10 grand. I'm sure Peter will get more money from me in the future. But anyways, this is how I found out about him. And then all these years later, I go back and now I uncover this whole story, how him and his team found Sue. And this huge story with the government, the government getting involved and essentially taking the bones and all kinds of ownership issues and massive legal case Fantastically cool story. But I have to tell you, the two scale replica skulls that I bought from Peter Larson's firm, the Black Hills Institute, are my two favorite possessions, period, bar none, that's it. In fact, I exchanged emails the other day with James Altucher because I saw that he posted that he threw everything out of his house and essentially an effort to be minimal he had pictures of all of his stuff on the street. I kind of sent him an email and I said, James, I relate to that. I said, but I tell you, my, my two skull replicas, these scale things. I mean, there's like the T-Rex is I'm trying to say it's like the size of a table. I'm sitting at this table right now. So maybe it's like three feet by six feet by six feet tall. I mean, it takes up a corner of the room, but it's awesome. It's awesome. If you got 10 grand to throw at anything, and you just want the coolest piece of furniture, the coolest damn thing you can put in your house, buy the scale T-Rex skull from Peter Larson. I think that's the first sales pitch that I've given on this show. And it's not because I'm trying to get Peter to make money, but it's like, it's just the coolest damn thing. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Peter Larson.
So listen, let me let me jump right in. I kind of gave you a little bit of background about me and at the now I should say from the very beginning, my my favorite piece of furniture, my favorite piece of furniture I have in my whole life is actually two things that I bought from you. A T-Rex skull stand and a Triceratops skull replica. And I, I have to I have to say, not because this is a sales pitch, but I'm just telling anybody out there, if you want to have the coolest piece of furniture in your room, that everyone that walks the room goes, where did you get that? And every person to a T says it, buy Stan from Pete, period. <laughs> So hopefully, hopefully we'll get a, a run of stands. <laughs> but listen, l- l- let me let me jump back. In, l- let me jump back in time a little bit um, before we even get into uh, you know the movie that's out right now or c- came out last uh, last year, uh, Dinosaur Thirteen. But going back even before finding Sue, Sue was not the first T Rex that you had encountered, was it? Well, actually, the only thing we had found from T-Rex before Sue was uh, individual bones. So Sue was uh, definitely the first skeleton that we collected. That was in 1990, and then in 1992 is when we found Stan, and since then we've found and collected eight more. Has there been a a method to the madness of finding them, or has it been a, a certain amount of luck each time? Certainly luck plays its part, also having done fossil collecting for so many years. I started when I was four. I and, and of course, the other people here at the Institute are really good at what we do. That is finding dinosaurs and picking them up. Um, but uh, mostly we have uh, these wonderful friends who tell us when they find something. I've actually never found a T-Rex skeleton. Mm-hmm. Um, all the looking that I've done, I've never found a skeleton. I found individual bones and uh, maybe two bones uh, in one site, that sort of thing. But but never a whole skeleton. And so we really depend upon amateurs and the ranchers who are out there in the field all the time to, to who make these, these, these discoveries. I told you this in email when I was watching dinosaur 13 and where the initial bones were sticking out from the cliff for Sue, uh, for the audience, a, a major T-Rex find that we're going to talk about right now. But I, I go back in time. I was probably 15 or 16 and my uncle and I were canoeing along the James river in Virginia. And he is kind of an outdoorsy guy. And he had found one vertebrae of something about the size of a basketball. And we went out and we were just looking at the fossilized shells along the riverbed there. And we kind of went up a little bit of a cliff and there was, I think, nice houses up at the top of the cliff and stuff like that. And anyways, uh, we, we just started poking around and we found one vertebrae poking out and then we found another and we were, we were finding the discs in between the vertebrae and then we got to the edge of the cliff and there was no more cliff and no more beasts. So we got about 10 to 12 of them. But I have to tell you, it's one of my favorite experiences. I'm probably, unless I was to come work with you and live your kind of life, there's probably not too many people that find something like that. Uh, it, it is definitely a wonderful thing to, to come across. And you have to be in the right place at the right time. Um, of course, these fossils are washing out, being destroyed all the time, and so you want to find them when they're first coming out, not when that's the first bit rather than the last bit that's, that's coming out. And as they come to the surface, they particularly things like that are old enough, like dinosaurs, the, the bones just fall apart in little pieces, and and that's what we saw with Sue was this kind of pile of little fragments of bones down below beneath the cliff. The experience of finding something like that is is of course, for me, one of the, the greatest uh, joys and, and pleasures and <laughs> and uh, hi- uh, highs, if you will, uh, that I can have. And, and so that's what I keep doing. I'm pretty much addicted to it. <laughs> let me let me go back to, to Sue. And I just as a little side note, my uncle decided after when he had these bones, he he actually decided he was going to be just leave them out in his yard lined up. Twenty five years later, guess what they became? Basically balsa wood. Yeah, 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 pretty they, sad. They keep the, the, and this was so since you had what you call the discs in between, that is an epiphysis where the the uh, mammal bones grow have a growth plate, and then they grow on both sides of that growth plate. So uh, you have a separation at the growth plate. Uh, so it was a mammal. Maybe if it was really big, it was must have been an el- uh, some sort of an elephant, a mastodon, or mammoth, probably. My guess. And that was probably Pleistocene, so it wasn't very old. 
it, it may have been gone back in, as far as Pliocene, but uh, so it may be at maximum, maybe maybe five million years old, uh, five six million years old. So uh, those will actually last longer because they're more like modern bone. Mm. Um, uh, but but still, even that, uh, even the rain with carbonic acid, which is to dissolve carbon dioxide in the in the rainwater, and of course. <laughs> Uh, not that long ago, we were having uh, acid rains with sulfuric acid because of the high pollutants that were put into the, the air by coal companies, um, which has now been ameliorated substantially by the EPA. But but uh, those things can uh, will will be destroyed too. A dinosaur bone will will be breaking up rather than dissolving. It'll be dissolving too, but it'll it'll just go go to pieces pretty rapidly, even more rapidly than what you saw. Let me get away, though, from my little amateur experiences and get to the find of all finds of T-Rexes. And so you're, 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 you're walking, I'm, I'm putting, I'm putting what, about 24 years ago. So you, you probably remember it like it happened yesterday when you first started to sniff what you had, correct? <laughs> oh, yeah. That, uh, it, uh, one of the, my, my, my fondest memories of my life, of course. And, uh, we were, we were working on a triceratops skull. A disarticulated skull. Susan came up with with a couple of pieces of bone in her hand, and those pieces of bone have these uh, honeycomb appearance. And um, as everybody knows, birds have air sacs. Uh, those air, air sacs are how they breathe. Well, dinosaurs, particularly meat-eating dinosaurs, also uh, sauropods, alumnic dinosaurs, have that same system of air sacs. Um, it's a system that is is very unique uh, among animals uh, shared with birds. Uh, it's a one-way respiratory system. And when I saw that honeycomb system in the bones, I knew that it was theropod uh, because we don't have any sauropods in the Hell Creek, uh, Hell Creek formation. And it was the, the curve of, on the outside of the bones. The pieces were, oh, just a couple of inches across. But but uh, uh, you could see the curve on the, on the outside of the vertebra was, was almost flat. And so the only animal that uh, was discovered at that point from the upper Cretaceous to the Hell Creek Formation is, is Tyrannosaurus rex, and still today is. So I was pretty sure that that's what it was when I f- saw those first two fragments of bone. We ran over, literally ran the two miles to the site, and <clears throat> when I got there, I saw this these fragments on the on the ground, uh, little fragments of vertebrae and, and other bones. And then I, I uh, went up to the cliff face and looked up at about uh, seven feet uh, above the base of the cliff. Here were these wonderful cross-sections of bones. Uh, then I crawled up on the cliff face and saw the three articulated vertebrae. And it was at that moment that I, I knew that it was all there. I knew that it was going to be this fantastic discovery. Uh, There's going to be a whole Tyrannosaurus rex. And I, I felt that the skull was still in there because I hadn't seen any pieces of teeth or anything else like that. And so I was, you know, just, it was from that point, moment on, I knew it was the best thing we'd ever find and, 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 uh, uh made plans, uh, started planning on how to dig it up and figure out what was going on in the, yeah, underground. How long from the moment you guys got there, you, you, you knew that was in there and you're going to, you're going to take that cliff down and you're going to get that thing out. How much time elapsed before you got it all back to the Institute? Actually, from the moment we uh, stuck the first pick in the ground, uh, actually picked up the first little pieces beneath the, beneath the cliff face, it was 17 days mm. until we loaded down the truck and moved out. <laughs> we started 30 feet above the specimen, digging down. Trying, I, I sort of calculated how, how big the specimen was going to be and how much uh, overburden we had to remove. And... Uh, if you don't take off enough the first time, you're going to have a lot of problems, potential problems, because you've got this cliff face, the vertical cliff face. And then if you're going to try to start digging higher up yet, uh, you're going to have some real problems. I mean, we, we could have poked in and started, you know, excavating, but then the more you uncover, the more danger it is because you're going to be, you know, you can slip the rock and break apart as you're trying to throw big chunks off the side, off to the side, and they can come down and hurt the bones. So we had... Uh, I wanted to just have that one cut, not not multiple cuts back in, risking danger to the specimen. Then, of course, having to cover it up and do all sorts of things to protect it. So in order to, to do it right, we, we did it right the first time. So did you know at that moment in time that you were finding a piece of, quote, land? <laughs> um, <laughs> we, did, we didn't suspect it was actually real estate, no. <laughs> That's 
that was that was a surprise to us uh, uh, a few years later when the judge decided that uh, the fossil was real estate. As you get it back to the institute, you know, obviously watching the film, the film Di- uh, Dinosaur Thirteen. So, how long were you preparing once you you get? You know, obviously you've got to take the the other rock off the bone. You've got to almost literally carve it out to some degree to kind of describe it. How long did that process take? Well, we had we had put 20, 21 months of work into the fossil. Of once we got it back to the institute, uh, you know, getting the uh, jackets opened and and doing initial preparation and then some final preparation and a lot of material. Um, we had spent twenty one months at that point, and we had the the biggest job uh, in which Terry was the main preparator, taking apart this the big block. The big block weighed about ten thousand pounds. It was about uh, eight feet by nine by ten feet by um in some places five feet thick and so there was a big block of rock and it had the um uh, the pelvis uh, uh one leg a good part of the dorsal series in the skull all encased in this one big block uh this the pelvis was actually sitting on the nose of the skull uh kind of midway down the the, the nasals, uh, removing that pelvis from the skull was, was, uh, quite a long process and had to get the bones out, uh, you know, one by one and take the pelvis apart as much as we could. We took the top il- uh, ilium off and to, in order to strengthen the bones that we were going to be pulling off of the skull, you know, to get some glue into them and things because, of course, uh, they were, as they uh, approached the edge of the cliff face, uh, the, Weight of the rock is being is is being relieved, so you have uh, sort of an up uh, an upswelling or upwelling of the rock itself. It's breaking, plus freezing and thawing, and all of this is just putting fractures into the bones as it's nearing the surface. And so you've got to get glue into them because if you don't do it right, you could have just a pile of pieces when you're trying to take off a big chunk of rock from from the skull, a big chunk of rock containing, of course, uh, the pelvis, etc. And by this time, you've already named. The dinosaur Sue. Oh, we named I named the dinosaur Sue the day the day it was found. <laughs> uh, for for Susan Hendrickson, who of course is the the person who made the initial discovery, uh, she uh, you know, she didn't know know what she had found exactly. Um, I think she probably had a suspicion it was maybe something like a T Rex, but she had no way of knowing that and until. You know, I was able to identify what what she had found. The, those pieces, those small fragments of bone. I don't. I don't want to go too much into the movie and uh, the the nuts and bolts of this. Is you know, you make this great find, and then claims, legal claims, and uh, and, and a massive court case. That, as I told you, an email I relate to uh, going up against the system, and you certainly went up against the system. But as you had the, still had the bones there, was there any science that you were able to, new insights that you were able to glean before uh, the government said, we are taking these bones? Oh, yeah. There was all kinds of all kinds of information that was right there. I mean, even in the field, <clears throat> we uh, noticed uh, some pathologies, which a pathology is evidence of, of uh, disease or healed injuries. And so we saw that the, the fibula on the left leg had been uh, broken quite badly and had a, uh, an, an infection in it. And that infection lasted till the, the end, of, end of her life. Uh, she had a sore leg for the her entire life and probably was at least initially potentially even incapacitating. So I started wondering about about relationships between T. rexes and uh, uh, the fact that we had found parts of a couple of other T. rexes with her made me wonder also about, you know, were these actually pack hunting animals? Did they kind of, if somebody was injured, would they uh, allow them to feed on a carcass? You know, that sort of thing. And then, of course, uh, the first thing that that uh, came up when we were digging, and um, I had named it Sue, and my brother Neil came up to to, to help with uh, the excavation and stuff, and he says, well, you shouldn't have named it right away. What if it's a boy, not a girl dinosaur? <laughs> and I said, well, that would be okay anyway, because after all, there is the Johnny Cash song. Yes, boy that's named a boy named Sue. <laughs> <laughs> but then I got to wondering, when we were having that discussion, I got to wondering, you know, is there a way to tell a male dinosaur from a female dinosaur? And so that started this whole 
uh, investigation thing that's still going on today, we've I think we pretty well nailed the answer to that. Yes, we can in terms of specific dinosaurs. We can with T. Rex, I believe, with with pretty good certainty, and that then relates to uh, other meat-eating dinosaurs. I think we'll be able to do the same thing as long as we have uh, two different types of skeletons, like we do with T. Rex, a more robust, a more heavily built form, and a more lightly built form. And it turns out the more heavily built forms are actually the girls. I want to ask a bunch of questions about T. Rex while I've got you, but I want to ask a little bit about you because I was trying to make some adjectives without not meeting you, but just looking at your life and career, I was jotting down words and I said, curious, passion, risk, tenacity, hunting, skeptic. Are these all you? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> where, did the, where did those come from? Was it, was it self-taught? Was there a family lesson, a mentor? Why do you have that attitude, those attitudes? Well, I, I did have, I did have a mentor. Uh, her name was June Zeitner. She was uh, she was uh, uh, had a, a museum in, in Mission, South Dakota, very near where I grew up, about eight miles away on a ranch. And uh, we had fossils on our ranch, so I was picking up fossils when I was very, uh, very young, starting about four years old. And then, and then she would loan me books and help me identify things, and just it was very encouraging. I had another mentor, my my uncle, or my mom's uh, brother who also uh, was very encouraging and my and my my folks were uh, encouraged my interest in it and you know when when uh, as as a young person I was just fascinated by the thought that these things are millions of years old and 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 you could go out and pick up something that that was once alive millions of years ago and and um, I don't know it just sort of it, it, it became it became um, uh, beyond a passion almost an addiction with me that that I had to go find more, and here I am today, still able to find brand new things, which is pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> we well, you know it's really cool that you've done too, and I know that you've you've had some critics, but I personally, look, I you know, I love the idea that you you are a T Rex entrepreneur, uh, many other dinosaurs as well, but a T Rex entrepreneur is a fair description, and that's kind of a cool thing that you've not only made it your passion, but you know, you can pay the bills and have a nice life too. I, I, of course, studied uh, uh, geology and paleontology, biology, all the things that you need to, to to do what it is that I do But, but in school. But there were not many jobs in paleontology. And plus, I'm kind of, I guess, independent, <laughs> you might say. And, and mm-hmm. so rather than getting a, a normal job at a museum where I could get to get to go out and perhaps collect fossils for uh, you know, a couple of weeks a year, I was able to, along with uh, some other folks here, was able to start a business and uh, be able to do it uh, at my own schedule. Um, you know, when it's nice out and the sun is shining, I can just with the drop of a hat go head to the field and go looking for fossils. I don't have to go. I don't have to ask anybody's permission or or put in for a grant or 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 uh, uh, you know have a have a program that's set up uh, except in my brain and 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 uh, I have the freedom to, to do things that uh, many people in my field do not yeah I love it I love it and I think that that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is I think that attitude translates regardless of field I think it's just a it's a good attitude to have it's a nice attitude to have in life and a lot of times people don't get a chance to experience that they they take the job as a young person whatever that job is and they wake up 40 50 years later and they go whoa my gosh I think I I think I didn't get some of that freedom I really wanted yeah I uh, you know when I talk to to students I always encourage them to follow their passion no matter what that is because you're going to be doing this for you know for the greater part of your life and at your, at, when you're at your best. And if you, you know, you can, like most people will, will have a job so that they can earn enough money to do what they like when they retire. Well, uh, many people find when they retire that, that they don't have the energy to do the thing that they wanted to do anymore. And they don't have that passion. That passion has been sort of lost. And so if it, you know, that you can have a job to earn money, or you, uh, so that you can have fun, or you can have fun and hopefully earn enough money to stay alive. <laughs> and and uh, you know, your the goal should not be 
should not be money, which is basically, after all, only fun tickets. Money allows you to do the things you want to do. But uh, you should you should uh, strive for for that 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 you you have a passion for and you know what what a wonderful thing to be able to do what you love every day to get up in the morning and say man i get to go do what i love again today Mm, (laughs) and uh you know i'm one of the luckiest people in the world to be able to do that and i you know i wish everybody could have that same good fortune Peter, let me ask you a couple T-Rex questions and maybe a couple odds and ends after that before we sign off. T-Rex, predator or scavenger? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were absolutely an active predator, but uh, like any predator, they're not going to pass up a free meal. Uh, it's just an, an, an all-eating machine. So if there's, if there's something to kill, I'll kill it. If there's something that's dead, I'll eat it. But it's just a, an eating machine. Yeah, they, these guys have have a uh, uh, a need to eat regularly. They're they're warm blooded. They're they're endotherms. They're not ectotherms. They're not going to wait around for something to die. You know, when when they're hungry, they're going to go out and kill something. Um, they're, the other thing to look at is in in, in our modern uh, world, we do not have any such thing as a large bodied obligate scavenger. The closest we come is is vultures, but they have the ability to search over hundreds of miles, hundreds of square miles in a day looking for something to eat. And even they, when they get particularly hungry, will go, will kill something. Uh, they're not, they're, they're more or less obligate scavengers, but they still will, will actually hunt, uh, if need be, if they can't find something to eat. The, the idea that T-Rex was an obligate scavenger like a vulture is just doesn't make any sense. Mm. Uh, besides, we have really, really good evidence of failed hunts. Uh, the latest one was uh, something I published with Robert De Palma, uh, who actually found a specimen and, and did most of the work on it. I'm just one of the co-authors. But uh, on a specimen of two fused and injured and had an infection, uh, caudal vertebra uh, from the mid-caudal of a, uh, a monosaurus synectans. And stuck in between the vertebrae and actually the bone had grown around this tooth was a T-Rex tooth. So obviously the, the, the animal was alive when it was bitten, it got away and uh, uh, it had an infection because of that tooth stuck in its bones, but it uh, uh, was able to survive and Amazing. survive for, for probably more than a year. Feathers and colors. Yes or no? Yes. On both counts. Um, uh, we don't yet know the colors of T-Rex, but we do know that they had, uh, like all theropods, had, at least when they were young, had, had a feathery covering of their body. Um, I suspect that they probably maintained those feathers uh, to, through adulthood, too. Uh, we, uh, T-Rex, after all, is more closely related uh, to a hummingbird than it is to Triceratops. Interesting. Yeah, I, it, well, I mean, I've always I've 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 heard this from uh, actually a conversation I had with one of your your peers in the industry, and he was famously saying, you know, well, you know, dinosaurs, there's avian and non-avian birds, and there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, soft tissue insights. Where where are we on soft tissue insights, if any, for the T Rex? Well, we can we know a bit about uh, some of the soft tissue of their. Uh, by looking at their descendants and their uh, their ancestors, uh, we know quite a bit about uh, how the muscles uh, were uh, situated, the muscle mass even, in some instances, we're able to determine from the scars on the bones. We know that uh, the males actually had a, what's called an intermittent organ, which uh, crocodilians, they share with crocodilians and ray-type birds. We know that they had, we know a bit about the skin. We found a couple, uh, about a, maybe a dozen small patches of skin on one of the T-Rexes that we dug called Y-Rex. So we know that their skin in, in certain places looked like that of the fine textured scales, if you will, on the foot of an emu. <laughs> um, we may, because we have some skin, we may actually be able to determine the color of that skin through work we're doing at the, the synchrotron at uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. I and, and uh, many of my, my colleagues from University of Manchester are working on 
on uh, various things like color of fossil feathers and uh, and and soft tissue preservation. So we're learning a whole lot more about about these animals. We know uh, that they had non-nucleated uh, red blood cells, like their like birds. Just a lot of very interesting things. We know uh, that they had uh, uh, theropod dinosaurs, like T. Rex, had two functioning ovaries and two functioning oviducts, which allowed them to lay two eggs at one time. We know that from their nests. Uh, we know uh, approximate running speed, uh, 25 miles an hour, is not uh, uh, unlikely for Tyrannosaurus rex as one of their top speeds, we, which uh, is plenty fast to outrun their, all they need to do is outrun their, their prey, which is very clear from the, the, the uh, way their legs are constructed, that they could outrun both Triceratops and the Hadrosaurus, duck-billed dinosaurs, the like Monosaurus and Nectins. Lots of things like that. Tons of tons of information on soft tissue, which we're we're gaining more data uh, as uh, as as every year goes by. Fascinating stuff for those people that are listening. It's just a few Google searches away to find the research and dig even in more in depth for all of those childhood dinosaur lovers like me still but uh listen let me ask let me ask the one kind of uh the kind of ending type question i mentioned uh sue and you find sue you and your team find sue the government there's a big controversy government takes it away ultimately sue is auctioned for 7.6 million and today sue stands in the field museum in chicago a heck of a story. Can I ask? Because I, as I mentioned earlier too, I, I had some interesting things with higher levels of government too and controversies. As you look back on it all, do you do you just say, "My gosh, the system is frankly a little messed up and a little rigged," and you're not bitter about it, or is there some bitterness about it too? Well, um, it was important to me to to not be bitter. This. Uh, then, then the opposite side wins, so to speak. If if I can keep my my sanity and not have, uh, you know, this this was for the most part people just doing their jobs. You know, there were a few uh, people that I would call evil on the other side, but but for the most part it was people just doing the, their jobs. The system is not a great system. It's not the best system in the world, despite what people might tell you. It is it is flawed. Of course, any system is flawed, but but the federal system is uh, of our federal government in the United States has some really bad things about it that uh, I've do talks on and things and trying to help bring bring about change. But it's not an easy thing. Congress can't agree on anything anymore. So to get new bills in Congress is going to be an almost an impossibility. <laughs> and the bureaucracy likes to protect itself too. Oh yes, it does. It's it's uh, it's it's definitely working working to preserve its jobs and its positions. And so, of course, uh, someone who's got a job is not going to say, "Well, my job really shouldn't even be here." And so, so we have a lot of a lot of waste and a lot of a lot of you know. Well, for instance, prosecutors are are, are graded on the cases they win. You know, they win the more the number of cases they win, rather than their ability to preserve justice and to bring to help bring about the right decision. It's it's about winning. It's not about what's right and wrong, and that's that's a problem. That's a that's a big problem. Especially when most Americans actually don't think that to be true. Unless you experience something like I did or experience something like you did, most people just think, "Oh no, the system's about justice and fairness." And then you, you get inside the you get inside the beast, so to speak, and then you then you mm-hmm. you, <laughs> you get scars on the back, and you say, "Uh-huh, "Uh huh, that little thing they told us when we were kids wasn't true." Yeah, no, and and it's very important that people understand that, and and the the whole concept of the prison system should is is flawed as well. It should be for uh, keeping people out of society. Who are would be harmful to society, not punishment. It's it, but it's it's all punitive, and and it's all uh, you know the the whole thing in the drug wars and all of that is is just insane. We we have more people in in, in our in the prisons in the United States, both number wise and percentage wise, as any country in the world, any country in the world, including China and Russia, 
there's something wrong with that. That yeah. I don't think we have more bad people in this country than there are in other countries. And uh, those people, mo- most of those people who are in prison shouldn't be there, shouldn't be just warehoused there as indentured servants, but they should be rather out. If they did something wrong to somebody, they should be paying that person back. Uh, if they, if they, uh, you know, if they're not a danger, if they're not violent people, there's no reason to lock them up. There's reason to, to find a better solution to, to, to this, to the problems and to try to help them to be better people. Uh, there's no such thing as, as, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the word, but of, of trying to help people change. In fact, if you incarcerate somebody, the chances that they're going to be incarcerated again go up exponentially. Well, look, I, here's the way I would sum this up, is that I truly detest the idea, and we, it could go in much different ways, but the idea of my tax dollars going to keep someone in jail for pot uh, is mind-numbing to me. It's just my, it's mind-numbing. Hey, let me ask one last question before I lose you. And because I brought it up early on, I want you to kind of explain this is an interesting one and can't really they'll have to watch the film. But basically, the government ruled that the bones that you found and I would like you to kind of explain this technically, but the bones that you found were were real estate, frankly. And that was one of the reasons that ultimately they were not in your possession uh, even to this day. So t- explain the idea of the government ruling that finding a bone is real estate. Part of it makes sense. So um, in this country, the owner of the surface rights owns the fossils that are on that property. Not the owner of the mineral rights, but the owner of the surface rights. And uh, in this particular case, the owner of the surface rights and mineral rights was uh, Morris Williams. And Morris Williams uh, had placed his property in trust with the United States government. Morris Williams was one eighth Native American. He was therefore able to do this. This the basic premise was that uh, Indian people were not able to make decisions related to land. And early on, they weren't, when when we forced them under reservations and did all these terrible things to them, that somebody might trade their land for a bag of groceries or something, a deed to the land, because they didn't have perhaps an understanding of ownership because they didn't believe in that sort of thing the way the way the white culture did. But in this day and age, what it does is it allows Native Americans a, uh, a tax break. They don't have to pay property taxes if they put that land in trust. So literally, because if, if Sue then the judge ruled was real estate, it was attached to the real estate. And if I had actually paid Morris after we had them loaded onto the trailers, like, if you were to put a house onto, uh, to, to separate it from the land, a house is real estate, unless it's separated from the land, unless it's on a trailer being moved, uh, we, and, and we could have done the same thing with Sue had I, you know, known this weird thing. We could have, uh, if we'd have paid Morris, it was then personal property, no longer real estate. And so it was something that, you know, who knew that, uh, this is the way things would be be uh determined but it was an interesting legal concept and in part and it, it still has not been changed today so it's still uh you know part of our law and this is this is kind of why when i was thinking about telling you about my example and i was seeing all the legal brouhaha with fossils and whatnot even to this day under the current administration i was like you know what maybe i should beep out where i was doing my little fossil dig <laughs> So, I was like, I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to join Pete. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, if you have permission from the owner of the of the property, and we did not have that's... permission, Peter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, hey, listen, uh, listen, I appreciate you coming on today. Where can everyone go? As I mentioned at the beginning of this show, I would, I think it'd be so cool if you text me in a couple weeks, a couple months, or whatever, and say, Mike, we actually had a couple people buy a T Rex based on the podcast. <laughs> That'd be awesome. And I got to tell you, it's, I'm going to, if people want to see the pictures of mine, it's at trendfollowing.com forward slash T Rex, T R E X. So you can see the pictures of mine. And this is what you can buy from Pete. And like I said, Pete has not told me to promote this. I just think it's the coolest thing I've ever bought. So, <laughs> Pete, where can we send people to check you out? What's the best website? The website is is 
B as well, it's it's the acronym for Black Hills Institute of Geological Research. So B H I G R dot com. Okay. And several books that they can find on Amazon as well. Rex Appeal and T Rex the Tyrant King. People can read up. And there's there's another one that, that uh uh it's actually my favorite is is a book called Bones Rock, which uh, is unfortunately out of print. We're we're working on a second edition of both Rex Appeal and Bones Rock. But it'll be a bit before they're out. But you might be able to find on, even on eBay, some old copies of, or on Amazon, maybe even some old copies of Bones Rock. And it's, it was done for, uh, for, for kids, but it was written in a way that even adults could understand. <laughs> um, I, I say that because kids know way more about dinosaurs than, than adults. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're smarter when we're kids sometimes. So. Uh, <laughs> hey, Pete, listen, I appreciate you coming on. Nice meeting you. And once again, thanks for the dinosaurs that I've had for the last 15 years. Well, you take care of yourself, and it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.